Okay, so uh, today we have uh, the pleasure of uh, having Javier uh, Villar, he's a speaker and um, he's studying at the University of La Rioja and we'll talk about computation and complexity and uh, P versus MP problem. We hope you enjoyed the talk and uh, I want you when the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Enrique. Uh, I, I'm Javier, I've, you've already said that, and I come here to talk about complexity theory, which is one of the most popular and rich subfields of what we call computation theory or formal computation. And it is famous and popular among other things because it is home to the PMP problem, one of the most famous open problems in mathematics. I'm going to divide this talk into four steps. First, I'm going to give some elementary introduction into what we might call the computation theory. I'm going to assume that most, if not all of you, have at least programmed something in your lives, but I will assume nothing else. I think like familiarity with the concept of a Turing machine, but it existing, nothing else. So then I'm going to establish the definitions of complexity theory, some of its main results. I'm going to give motivation for its concepts. I'm going to build the PMP problem from it. And I'm going to take a look at how it stands today, why it's hard, why we haven't been able to crack it yet. So the first object of computation theory we're going to look at is the algorithm. An algorithm is basically a problem together with a sequence of unambiguous instructions that will lead you to solve it in a finite amount of time. The finite time is the important part here. The thing is, this concept has been around before the advent of modern computing theory, but nevertheless, it well, because of it, it is very informal in its statement. We're going to try and formalize it a bit. In particular, the problems we are going to look at, partly because of historical reasons, partly because of convenience, are computing the result of functions that take in natural numbers and output a natural number. If there is an algorithm able to compute this function for some input, then the input will be in the domain. The domain will be the set of inputs for which we can get the result of the function in finite time. And we're going to call P to the N the set of computable problems with an input. The thing is we haven't yet established what should be computable in finite time is. And we will discuss some notions on this number of inputs because this is a condition which is not as strong as it might seem. The thing is, model computing theory starts with probably the point to start for me is a Hilbert's program. I won't delve into the detail here, but it was a research program established by David Hilbert into the foundations of mathematics. He tried to prove, among other things, that mathematics was complete, consistent, and decidable. Without going into too much detail, it is famous that Kurt Gödel murdered this problem. Like, the first two statements are unachievable. A completeness is unachievable, and consistentness cannot be proven, but it is left it should, it should be proven or disproven that mathematics can be decidable. And this is the basis of what is called the Anschaikung's problem, the decision problem, which is the challenge of finding an algorithm that determines whether some logic formula can be deduced from the axioms or not. And here, there, there was a fundamental observation by, by Turing which was that, the, that this notion of algorithm was too informal to be useful. And so Turing, what he did was develop a model of computation that allowed for a formal definition of what something computable is. And he introduced the Turing machine. I'm not going to go into too much detail. The notion is that this is an artifact 
which can be in one of a series of states and which operates on a tape. Normally it is assumed to be infinite, but space we will see is a very weak condition here. The thing is it operates on a tape and it can read the cell of the tape it's standing on. And from that there is a transition function which will just from the state it currently is seen and from what it reads, it will decide what state to go to, what to write on the cell it's standing on, and if it wants to, if it wants to go left, right, or stand still. And Turing, what he did was establish that something was computable if and only if a Turing machine could compute it with a finite number of calls to the transition function. The thing is, this seems very sophisticated, an example, and this is very arbitrary. What we have is the CMT thesis, the Church Mark of Turing thesis, which is a statement, which is maybe the most in informal part of computation theory, because it is rather empirical rather than formal, in the sense that we have tried to give more power to a Turing machine, we, and we have failed. And by other means, we have reached models of computation like a church lambda calculus and Markov Markov systems, which are at most as powerful as a Turing machine. And we have even tried to give these Turing machines superpowers, like a Turing machine that computes with several different tapes or different heads, or that can jump arbitrarily to what it wants on the tape rather than going left or right, or that it can see the future. <laughs> we haven't been able to find a Turing machine that can that is more powerful, not in the sense of going faster, which is the second question of the talk, but in the sense that every of these models couldn't introduce a partial computable function that wasn't computable by a Turing machine or couldn't make the domain of one existing bigger. And so the Turing machine will be the base of a, the concept of algorithm. And when we define partial computable functions, what we are going to do is associate a partial computable function by the theme, by the CMT thesis is exactly a function for which there exists a Turing machine that given us a, some given input will compute this function in a finite amount of time for every point of the domain. We have a, we have a total correspondence between Turing machines and partial computable functions, which is cool. Because if we, if you recall, we have a finite number of states the Turing machine could find itself in. There is a finite amount of symbols it can draw on, on the tape. And if we limit ourselves for to binary Turing machines, which I don't think I have to explain are powerful enough because we are talking through a computer. The thing is, if we limit ourselves to binary Turing machines. Uh, because every possible input to a transition function will be from a finite set. This uh, transition function is finitely definable. It, is, it has a finite amount of decisions it can make. And so what happens is that there is a countable number of them. There is a countable number of Turing machines, which also means there is a countable number of problems of partial computable functions. And we have a canonical ordering on the set P to the N, which is given by global numbering. And I'm not going into global numbering, but it follows some properties which are good. And we can use this ordering and other factors to prove that there exists universal Turing machines. I assume most people here are familiar with these things existing. Basically, they are Turing machines that when given the index of another Turing machine and some input, 
will compute exactly the same partial computable function as that other chain machine. This is a cursed fact here, which is that a compiler is really a choice function, <laughs> which makes me laugh every time because I'm weird. And also, if we treat these inputs as a number in a binary base, because we are dealing with uh, binary tuning machines, what happens is that a partial computable function with n inputs turns out to be just some number in, bin in binary form, and n is just a number relating to the logarithm of this number. So really, we can only think about functions that go from the natural numbers to natural numbers, and we have we can use the length of how big the input is in binary as a measure of the complexity of the input. Because if you have a bigger input, what happens is that every problem that was in a smaller set is contained in this. So we will only find harder and harder problems. This is important because now we are going to start with complexity theory. Complexity theory deals with um, uh, assigning resources to these chewing machines, like time, like the space of the tape we are going to need, like those kind of stuff. There are some complexity measures that measure how hard it was for this chewing machine to compute this problem. And for this, we use Bloom complexity measures, which are a, a sequence of partially computable functions that follow these two actions. Basically, there is an assignment one to one of one of these functions of the complexity measure with a given two machine. And they can be, for example, a chronometer. There is one of these functions which is running alongside the original uh, uh, the Turing machine. And at each step it takes, it clicks one. And so you end up with a very tight measure on how many steps it took for the Turing machine for this given input to compute this. And this is computable because if it will take the Turing machine an infinite amount of steps, we are outside the domain. And so we can claim that the complexity measure is outside of the domain. So this is well defined. The thing is that normally in practical terms, we don't like such tight measures because discriminating every possible input is hard. Like we don't want a complexity measure that will be as hard as the function itself. It's trying to predict the hardness of. And so what we do is these functions really take in the value ln n, which was the size of the input for the finite tuning machine. So really we have functions which are, which are monotonic increasing and which follow the, the hardness of computing a set of inputs which are bounded in size. This is what we're going to use for the most part. For example, the time measure, the most used one does this. It is an analogous to the chronometer, but at each length to take the worst case of them all. This is called a uh, worst case complexity in the theory of, of complexity theory. There are other kinds of complexity, but this is where the PMP problem lives, and this is the most used one. And if you consider worst case complexities with Bloom's actions, you are able to prove these two theorems. I'm not going to go into the particular detail. I can give a sketch of the proof of the first one. The first one, what it tells us is that if we have some function that bounds the time it will take for a given tree machine to compute an algorithm, there will be another tree machine that computes the same problem. Take notice that even though each problem appears once in our succession, 
maybe there is more than one Chile machine that would compute the same and they don't have to do it as fast as the other. So what we what this theorem tells us is that we can ignore linear factors is except for some residue of size 2n. What this does is it uses the fact that uh, we haven't ex well it cheats a little what it does is compress the the elements on a tape and so it makes a chewing machine that technically is operating on several symbols at the time we've established that these are as powerful as the others this is technically cheating but we are going to allow it and then we have bloom's speeding up theorem <clears throat> which states that for any complexity measure you like and every computable function f, there is at least one problem for which for every solution we give it, it can be sped up by the order of f. Like if you have f b to, to the n, an exponential, you can find for this particular problem that will exist for every solution, a solution that goes exponentially faster. What these two things tell us is that uh, we will, well, uh, optimal algorithms are not a thing. Like you can find an optimal programming for some program for some problem, and also it motivates us to use big O notation. And this works exactly like in calculus. Uh, like if you take the uh, an algorithm and then execute another just behind it. It will be all of the sum of the complexities, decompose, they do this stuff. And we can define complexity classes, which is we take a function f and we take every pro problem such that there is at least one solution for it that goes fast enough such that f bounds the complexity measure for every input of a computable input. And these complexity classes are really important because they are what defines our problem that we're going to tackle uh, after this. If we define the class of every problem which is bounded by some a polynomial, then we have the P class, which is the first part in our problem. And this class is relevant because of what is called the Cotton thesis which only notes that P is the smallest class closed by composition, which is useful for programming because composition of complexities happens when you call a subroutine that also has the ability to make loops of length n, which is reasonable to assume for any programmer. So the P class is the reasonable class, it's the smallest class which will have things that we want to have. We might think, is this the only class? It is not, because there exists the time hierarchy theorem. It gives us that for a given function in time, there is an analogous for space. We're going to discuss space complexities later. If, if we have a, a function and the time complexity measure, then we can separate the class limited by this from another for any function that, that follows that thing. That the thing is that would you have an exponential factor, it, it is going to divide into a proper subset. And the, the problems bounded by exponentials are slower than the problems bounded by polynomials that will be expected. Now, what we can do is look at the fact that we have alternative models to Turing machines. And there's an important one, which is the non-deterministic Turing machine. The non-deterministic Turing machine is the Turing machine such that instead of the function that gave us the transition being one valued, it will have multiple values. And it is a machine with hatch, which has infinite luck, or which can see the future <laughs> in the sense that it will always choose the best possible transition. And we can define 
the class of algorithms bounded in time by a polynomial for a non-deterministic twin machine. And we define the NP class, which might seem useful considering we are tackling the PNP problem. There is another famous equivalence to this APMP class, which is that they are the problems for which a solution can be verified in a reasonable amount of time. This is called, this is expressed as they have an algorithm which is polynomial deterministic, which when given the input a solution and some additional information into how the non-deterministic Turing machine found the solution. It can follow the steps given by the non-deterministic Turing machine. And it can, in this way, verify that the proof was accurate. It, it, we can show this in this diagram. The green nodes are those that have below them a path that can lead to the solution. The green lines are the path taken with the non-deterministic machine. And the thing is that if the non-deterministic two machine gives its certifier the, the information on which path it has chosen at every point, then the polynomial certifier might go down the same path in a polynomial number of steps. The thing is that this tree might be too wide for the for a polynomial machine that is non that is deterministic to go down every one of them and check every one of them. So maybe maybe a polynomial a, a, a deterministic machine cannot do in polynomial time what a non-deterministic one can in polynomial time. Here we have the PMP problem, also called anxiety. It's a problem which is verifiable in a reasonable about amount of time, also solvable in a, in a polynomial amount of time. This is interesting, for example, for the sake of cryptography, because cryptography, technically, if you give a, the process of deciphering a cipher, given the key, it's a process of verifying a solution because what happens is that you take the decrypted message, you take the key, and you can encrypt it and see if it gives the same encrypted message you received. So is every encryption system breakable in a reasonable amount of time? This is the motivation that arises arose the PMP problem. The PMP problem was formalized by John Nash in a letter that talked about cryptographical aspects of it. And what happens is that we get to the modern treatment of this, which goes through oracles. An oracle is a way of cheating in a limited way. You get an oracle A, which will be a set of partial computable functions, and you give it to some Oracle machines, some machine, to machines with an Oracle. And what happens is that they can, at any point, ask the Oracle for the solution of its partial computable functions, and it will be granted in just one step, like immediately, instantly. And the thing is that you can reduce the complexity of some given problem, because maybe if you have some instant information of something that is not immediately clear, uh, immediately clear, maybe this way gives you a way to solve a problem in a more efficient way. So maybe the class C with an oracle is bigger than the class C without the oracle. This is what drove Cook. A Cook was a man who thought about oracles given to the deterministic two machines, thought about how P to the A behaves because you give P a polynomial oracle, oracles behave like calling subroutines. If you deoracleize it, but have a polynomial algorithm for every function in the oracle, what happens is that instead of calling it in one step, you call it and wait a polynomial amount on it. So what happens is that if you give P an oracle which is in P, it, you will have P again. 
is, is stated as p is low on itself in in the theory and this is called a cook reduction you reduce every problem in a given class to a problem which is in a given oracle and cook is so that the problem sat which is the problem of given some propositional logic assertion determining if some assignment to each literal it can give you a true result as a of the formula this problem is an oracle such that np is inside p to d this moreover this is in np so really what happens is that p to the sat is equal to np this motivates the definition of a C complete class of problems, which are problems such that every problem in a given class is reducible to it, meaning P to the C hat problem contains this C class. And we define the C complete as the problems which are C hat and also in C, which means that P to the problem is going to the C class exactly. And there is the cook leaven theorem, which states that the MP complete class is non empty. Moreover, it was shown by CARP that 21 problems were in MP complete. We know of a lot of them now. Every nasty graph problem we do have grappled with, like the traveling salesman, minimal vertex cover, they are all in MP complete. They are pain in the ass everywhere. And what happens is that P is equal to MP if and only if for any problem in MP complete you have it belongs to B. And this seems good. We have reduced a very big problem, the MP problem to just talking about the efficiency of some individual problems. What happens, well, the first thing that happens is that we think B is not equal to B. Proving that a problem doesn't have a solution in polynomial time is a really hard question. The other thing is the pain. <laughs> we can't do the barriers. The barriers are a set of results that are not about the PMP problem, rather about arguments that you could try and use to find the solution for the, the PMP problem. I'm going to talk about uh, the relativization barrier, the algebraization barrier. I'm not comfortable enough with the natural proof barrier and we don't have enough time. I can give some sketch of a proof if someone wants uh, later in the question time. What happens is, you can think of the relativization barrier as analogous to, for example, saying that the proof is generalizable to, to a proof in calculus is generalizable to talking about functions at almost every point. Like if you have a theorem, which is proven by a method of proof, which can be generalized to that, what happens is, for example, this theorem won't be able to prove that two functions are equal because it won't distinguish between functions that are different in a very small set. And what happens here is that there are proofs that relativize, meaning that the whole proof can be reproduced when given P and MP both the same oracle. And the problem here is that Baker, Gill, and Solovey proved that there exist two oracles such that for one, the PMP problem gives one answer, and for the other, it gives the contrary one, <laughs> which is a pain in the ass. Because every proof that relativizes then can find contradicting results to the problem. Because the, if the proof can be uh, reproduced for adding oracles, then you can add the oracle with the one solution and the oracle with the other. And you might ask how common is for proof to relativize? Terribly common, right? Almost everything 
that was tried in the first 20 years of the PMP problem was shown to relativize. Then the natural proof barrier was shown. Then there was a theorem I'm going to show later that didn't relativize. And what they proved with it was the algebraization barrier. Like everything you try that doesn't fall into one of these barriers, immediately we prove that it is the definition of another barrier. The algebraization uses a technique called algebraic extension of oracles, which is considering that these oracles, we can assume them to be with binary inputs. What you can do is think of these partial computable functions of the oracle as a restriction to Boolean values of a polynomial function on some larger field, F, a finite field, and what happens is that you can create two oracles that are not the same. You can go over the relativization barrier because the oracles will not be the same, but one of them that, like it's the germ of the other. They are related in some way. The thing is that we say that an inclusion of classes algebraizes if it respects this kind of thing. And there are results that algebraize and have been proven through uh, this technique, but it was so shown by Aronson and Wittgerson that the NP not included in P does not algebraize, which means, again, that any proof which falls into an algebraization technique will not be powerful enough to prove the PMP problem. In a general sense, you can think of these things as a, the technique is not sophisticated enough, like it's trying to prove too much without considering enough stuff. Like for example, for the relativization barrier, what happens normally is that you assume some function exists and you create an analogous function which with some caveats, for example, Turing's uh, argument on the halting problem relied heavily on this kind of technique, a technical diagonalization. And the thing is that this function, you are not looking inside it. And maybe at some step it's calling the oracle. And what happens then is that really you can't differentiate between functions that call oracles and functions that not, do not. It is very difficult. What might, might be tried is to create some bigger lattice of complexity classes which are related between them and uh, create some stronger, maybe stronger uh, arguments that are able to solve the PMP problem. For example, Lanner proved that if P is not equal to B, that there must be some function which is in MP, but is not complete in MP. And what happens is that this relates heavily with what we call the complement of MP, a co MP, which are not the problems that can be verified in polynomial time, but the problems that can, for which a solution can be discarded in polynomial time. And what happens is that we do not believe these classes are separate. But uh, them being different is a stronger uh, result than the PMP problem. Separating them will be magical. For example, tautology is in CoMP. It is the complement of the satisfiability thing we talked earlier. Like the satisfiability it, it means there is a combination of values for the literals that make it evaluate to true. Tautology means there is no set of values for the literals that make it evaluate to true. So really, in one, it is easy to give a set of values and prove it evaluates to true. And in the other, it is easier to give a counterexample. It is rather in the nature of how we mathematicians prove stuff. <laughs> there are other classes that are defined on some other kind of Turing machines. For example, you can 
do a non-deterministic to machine, but instead of always choosing the first option, it will choose at random. And so we have, for example, the PP class, which is the class that solves problems in polynomial time, but the answers it gives have a probability of slightly more than one half of being right. The BPP class, which assumes more certainty, we have MA, which is, we, we are going to talk about this one later, which is analogous to MB, but instead of certifying in polynomial time, it has a probabilistic certifier. And we have BQP, which is analogous to BPP, but it uses magic, <laughs> also called as the quantum role. <laughs> I don't know a lot of, about quantum computing, I leave it there because I know it exists. For example, SOAR algorithm, the famous SOAR algorithm is in BQP. That's an incentive to talk about it. Then we have interactive proof systems, which are analogous to an algebra class, in the sense that you have two parties, a teacher with infinite wisdom, and a pupil, which has severely less power of deduction. And what happens is that the powerful party is going to try to gaslight the other interesting mission. <laughs> so what happens is that there is a number of messages between the two parties and these problems have the, the party that couldn't think about the answer has nevertheless to become convinced of the answer that is given to him. For example, MA is here. We have a system uh, which we call a Merlin, which has infinite wisdom. And what happens is it sends correspondence with a BPD Turing machine, an alpha, which is not so sure of himself and cannot prove as many things as Merlin. But Merlin gives him proofs which are unreliable. And what happens is that Arthur is always trying to correct them. IP, for example, is the interactive proof systems that are bounded in a polynomial number of messaging. And this is the film that sparkles the algebraization barrier. IP is equal to problems which are bounded in, in polynomial space. I'm running out of time, I've gone too slow, but this is the result that went over the relativization barrier and over the natural proof barrier, but couldn't overcome the algebraization barrier. We have a lattice of important classes. Here are some cool ones. The thing is, almost every content we haven't proven it's proper. We don't know if these are all the contents. And what we have is a, a very strong certainty on almost any question regarding a complexity. In the sense that, for example, a, I've signaled here the PMP problem. We have the class PH polynomial hierarchy, which has a very complicated definition. It is defined as a given union we uh, the form part is that PMP is equivalent to PPH, but what he, we use this class for is the fact that it is very sensible to some contents existing. For example, if we were to assume that MP is inside P slash poly, which is a class I'm not going to try and talk today about, what happens is that PH collapses to just being a finite union of two terms. And what we think is that this cannot be, that pH needs the limit in this union, that it is not equal to any finite each subunion of its definition. And so we have some kind of evidence against this content. We don't think it exists. And so with a lot of other things, because a lot of statements we are not certain of, but like if PMP is true, this will imply that a lot of things we hold as true are false. There are a lot of things that interrelate between each other. It is a complicated field. 
finally I I would want to give some notes on spy on space complexity. Space is a measure analogous to that of the chronometer of time, but it uses the number of cells which are interacted by the machine. And you might ask, is there a PMP problem for space? And the answer is no, there is not. Savage film proved that non-deterministic space can be replicated in deterministic space. What happens is that this proof, because of the barriers, cannot be imported to the time one, which is the same. And if you want anxiety fuel, this space, you can see it's the third one, it's buried up there. We don't know if the content of P inside P space is proper. And this gives me nightmares <laughs> at night because like P space is very big by all measures. Space is very cheap in comparison with time, or at least we theorize, because we haven't been able to prove that they are different. And this is quite a measure on how little we really know about how these classes relate. Consumed most of the time, but this is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening to me. And if there is any question, I'll be glad to take them now. Great, so we will have to uh, unmute and let's give a clap for Xavier here. Thank you, Javier. This was a beautiful talk. And we'll Thank ask, you very much, Enrique. I will ask uh, if anyone has any question, you can post it in chat or just say that. Uh, yes, maybe better in chat because audio yeah. is not working properly now for me, at least. Okay, yeah. It will be on our end. I don't know how can I see chat here. I'm trying so hard. Okay, I see it now. You can post whatever. Can I ask one at least? Yes, okay. yes, of course. Uh, so I didn't understand what is notion of uh, algebraicity and extensions. What, what is it about? I, algebraic extensions. Uh, yes, what happens with them is like you might think of uh, the functions in, in the Oracle as being functions that take in values zero or one, a, a, an m tuple of them, and gives out a zero or a one. This is an, an acceptable restriction. And what happens here is that this zero and this one can be the zero element and the one element on some finite field. And what happens is that this function can be extended by uh, it can be transformed into a polynomial through some basic means. And what happens is that this will be a polynomial function over some a finite field. I haven't given a much of the intuition on a how this field is chosen or the degree of this polynomial, but the thing is that these functions can be understood as a particular cases, restrictions of some polynomial. And what happens is that you give to one class an oracle made up only of the Boolean restriction of the polynomial. And to the other, you give it the ability to see the value the polynomial takes at every point of the finite field. And what will happen with this is that the algebraic oracle is slightly more powerful in the sense that it has some local information about the inputs that the, the Boolean uh, counterpart didn't have. And so there is a little asymmetry there. What happens is you would like to be able to give the same oracle to both classes in your proof, because as I said, it is very hard to make a proof that doesn't separate oracles. But what you can do is give one of them an oracle which is mostly the same, but with a little more power to break that symmetry there. And what happens is then the algebraization barrier, which I don't think I have mentioned, only works one way. It can't 
you can't use algebraization techniques to prove P is not equal to P, but you can use them to prove P is equal to P because of how the algebraization works here. Have I solved it? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. Uh, maybe you can stand up and maybe get it to the microphone. Yeah, so do we have any example of a reasonable problem that is in X but is not in P, and we know that? A reasonable problem which is in X. Yeah. I haven't worked with with X, X time that much, but it is theorized that, if, for example, there is a, what is called the extended time hypothesis, which is that a, the Saturday's viability can only work in polynomial time. What happens is that it, it is suspected. Well, it is proven that you can do this because it is an MP and not strictly in X time. It is proven that it can work in, I think it was 1.43 to the N or something like that. I don't know of a problem which is strictly in two to the N. If you want examples of problems which are in certain classes or explanations of classes or a more complex lattice, I recommend a web, it's called Complexity Su. El Fo de la Complejidad, which is run by Scott Aronson, one of the people who proved the theorem about algebraization. And it has a very detailed account of almost everything that is to be known in complexity theory. I cannot give you now an example which is strictly exponential, but I hope I, that's enough for you for the moment. I invite, I invite you to consult further. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. About, uh, it's curious because I didn't know about the quantum complexity zoo, but not the complexity zoo. So uh, it's good to see that it exists. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. If not, we can thank Javier again.